So hold on to your hats today because we're going to be flipping through a lot of scripture. I'll give you a clue. If you have your Bibles and you intend to use them this morning, we are going to read a, a couple verses out of Luke, and then we're going to be in our main passage, which is John chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, 29 through 34. Then we're going to mention Exodus. You don't have to turn there. And then we're going to be in Hebrews. That's the good one. Hebrews, and then we're going to be in Revelation, which we've already read part of this morning. So that's where we're going. That's the map, if you dare to follow. If you're using your Bible on your phone, it might be easier than flipping the pages in the book. I don't know. The Gospel of John refers to the baptism of Jesus, but it doesn't tell us about the baptism of Jesus. For that, we have to look at the other Gospel. So in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 22, it says, One day when the crowds were being baptized, so a lot of people were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. There, done deal. As he was praying, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit come down in bodily form descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Fathers, we need to be telling our children that on a regular basis. You know, it's good for the soul. You, except if it's a daughter, then I would say daughter instead of son. But you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. So here's that identity piece again that we talked about identity last week. For Jesus, this is a confirmation. If he had any doubt about who he was, what he was for, here we go. Bam. His father, God, descended on him as he was praying and said, You are my son, and I am well pleased with you, and you bring me great joy. And he knew he was going to be sent out to do what God had intended for him to do. For John, the Baptist, this is the answer to his prayers of several years of watching and waiting and hearing about Jesus. And we read about this in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. <clears throat> so this starts with the next day. The previous day was when the rulers and authorities from the temple had come and quizzed John about who he was and about his ident <clears throat> identity. So this is the next day. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Bam! Done deal. The search is over. When John observes Jesus walking along towards him, he declares to his disciples, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he explains to them how he knows. First of all, by what God spoke to him and told him to expect. And second, witnessing the very thing God told him to look for. Guess what? God tells us the same thing. He has told us what to expect. We don't always get it, and sometimes it's mysterious. But we told God, God has told us what we can expect as his people, as his children, as his followers. He's told us what we can expect, that he's coming again. We don't know exactly how that's going to work, but we know it's happening. And number two, witnessing the very thing God told him to look for. Here it is, right in front of him. John witnessed the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus. And we don't know if he heard what God said, 
But he witnessed what he was supposed to witness, and he knew. He knew. And now here is Jesus having been baptized. And we know from the other Gospels that after being baptized by John, he was sent into the, or led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And he didn't eat anything. And we have those three temptations that Satan put him through. And now he's back and ready to begin what he came to do. This is a pretty big moment in time. In history, in John's life, in Jesus' life. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was a pretty heavy title to lay on someone. What is John thinking and what is he saying? What is his meaning? What is it we should take away from hearing this title for Jesus ourselves? We'll go back to Exodus. Before the last night that the Israelites dwelt in Egypt, Moses was instructed to tell them to slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the doorposts of their homes. Do you recall why? Anybody want to shout it out? Okay, so I'll, I'll say I'll say it. Pick me. So they put the, the, lamb, uh, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes so that the angel of death, when it came over Egypt to kill the firstborn, which was the final plague, would kill the firstborn of all the Egyptians, the Israelites would be spared that curse, that plague, if they had a mark of blood on their doorposts. They would pass, the angel of death would pass over the marked homes. That's why we have the word Passover. It was a sign of protection and trust in the saving power of God. An innocent lamb had to be killed in order for them to be saved. Let me repeat that. An innocent lamb had to be killed in order for them to be saved. The first Passover happened in chapter 12 of Exodus. In chapter 20, we have the giving of the Ten Commandments. And what follows after that is how Israel will be set up to worship God. In chapter 29 are the instructions for the dedication of the priests, Aaron and his sons. And right after that, in verses 38 through 42, God lays out the sacrifice for the sins of the people. It requires two lambs per day being sacrificed, one in the morning and one in the evening. Twice a day, the people will be reminded that sin has a consequence that requires sacrifice in order for forgiveness and restoration to happen. How many reminders do I need a day? There are probably not enough lambs in Bradford County. But that was the old law. That was old. John the Baptist knew why Jesus had ultimately come. And he is speaking that truth at this moment in time. The sacrifices in the temple went on until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And the sin offerings truly weren't needed after the death of Jesus Christ. But not everyone bought that. So, you know, they continued. Jesus isn't referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world often in the New Testament. But the author of Hebrews wrote a pretty lengthy explanation concerning what Jesus accomplished through his sacrifice. He contrasted the Old Testament law with what Christ accomplished. And I can't say it better. I could not come up with creative words to say it better than the writer of Hebrews did. So we're going there next. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. These are amazing and powerful words. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. So in the Old Testament before Christ, it was just a shadow. It was a foretelling of how things would be when God's plan was completed in sending Jesus Christ. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. They were less than perfect. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped 
For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. I think that is so key. When the perfect sacrifice comes, who is Jesus, it takes away not only our sin, but our feeling of guilt. I would wager to say that most of us still hang on to guilt, but that's not the plan. That's not the purpose. We're also supposed to quit sinning so the guilt doesn't come back. But we're forgiven, perfectly forgiven. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given, oh, you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the scriptures. Whew. Submission, total submission, surrender. First, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us, for us, to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Amen? Amen. 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 Oh my goodness, that should get us a little bit excited. This is what Jesus came to do, to forgive our sins once and for all. If we have to be forgiven again, that's on us, and we keep on going back. But they're forgiven. They're forgiven. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Do you know who's made perfect? You. You are being made perfect. You have been made perfect through the sacrifice of Jesus. Friends, do you realize that this is your inheritance being spoken of here? For real. This isn't just, oh, this nice Sunday morning message. This is the real truth of our lives. If we are in Christ, this is it. Jesus forever made you perfect by his complete and final sacrifice and shedding of blood. There is nothing else we need to be made right with God. But to receive this great gift and to receive it every day, to receive it every time we sin. We don't live in shame. We don't need to live in shame. We need to live in repentance, get over it, and get on with it. That's the invitation. That's the invitation. We, we should be walking around with so much joy that we literally float. I mean, could you imagine? I'm forgiven. I don't have anything to worry about me. There's nothing holding me down. But think about the things we allow to hold us down, right? Do you have a list? Past junk. It's forgiven. It's forgiven. It is forgiven. Anything you've ever done wrong is forgiven. But Hebrews is not the last mention of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have to see what it says in Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 13. And we already had a sneak peek. We're going to look a little bit more. And realize that the one who wrote the words we are about to hear was the same one who recorded John the Baptist and what he said in the first chapter of his gospel. It all fits. I love it. Scripture fits one end to the other. It's, 
mind blown. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Revelation 5, 6 through 13 says, John speaking on the island of Patmos, then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. Hmm. Wonder who that was. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into the, every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll, scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they held gold bowls, get this, filled with incense, which are the prayers of the people of God. I love that image. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seal and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood was ransomed, has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. There are a lot of ways to read the book of Revelation. My favorite way to read it is as a worship guide. It really tells us how to worship Jesus and why he alone is worthy of that kind of worship, where we fall down on our faces, where we give it all we've got. That's why I sing with gusto, because it's worth giving Jesus all I've got. This is the same Jesus that we just read about, that we worshiped on Christmas Eve. It's the same Jesus who has given us a new name written down in glory. This is the same Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit to rest on us and fill us and transform us. This is the same Jesus who calls you by name and tells you he loves you and that you bring him great joy. This is the same Jesus who breathed his church into creation and chooses to work in us and through us to make his love and truth known in a broken world. This is your Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. What would you say to him in your heart or out loud in the next few moments? Respond to him. Would you just take a minute and respond to Jesus with whatever your heart is calling out? Will you allow this Jesus to impact how you live this week? Will it change any kind of guilt you carry? Will it change your outlook, your joy? Will it remind you of your identity? Will you choose to live in the forgiveness and freedom he bought for you when he died on the cross to take away the sin of the world? I don't think I'm overreaching to say that is what he wants for us. That is what Jesus wants for you. He wants you to live in freedom. He does not want you to live bound up to sin or despair or sorrow 
or guilt or shame or blame. Mm. That's not what he wants for you. He wants you to have his joy and his peace. It's for you. It's yours to respond to. Amen. Now, you've heard me talk about this for weeks, but it's finally here. Following worship today, Brian and Gary and I are getting in my car and driving to Syracuse and getting on a plane and flying to Greenville, South Carolina, where we will join several thousand of other eco-Presbyterians for our national gathering. I'm probably more excited than two of them put together, but that's okay. I'll carry them on my enthusiasm. <sighs> anyway, there will be large meetings. There will be small meetings. There will be unintentional gatherings of groups of people over coffee and other beverages. There will be worship, both contemporary and traditional. There will be a lot of people. There will be a meeting of the synod, of which Gary and I, Brian and I will represent our church as commissioners. Because we're 10 years old as a denomination. We're 10, and things need to be tweaked. So overtures have been written that are just about, how can we do this better? How can we live into who we said we want to be? Nothing controversial. Oh my goodness, thank you, Jesus. Nothing controversial. Just which way seems to make better sense to get to where we all want to go? I'm so excited. We expect to gather information. We expect to be motivated, collect ideas, and worship God in a different context from our worship today. And we would covet your prayers for travel and attentiveness, not just for us, but for the eco staff, the volunteers at the church in Greenville, because how many people do you think a church needs to host 3,000 people? That's a lot of people. Like, where are the bathrooms? There's got to be like 10 people showing me that. I've asked that we be prayed over by the elders and the church as we head out. So Sandy's going to come and lead prayer for us. So Brian and Gary, come on up. This is called commissioning. We are being commissioned as your commissioners to go and do this. And then if anybody else wants to come up and lay hands while we do this, or if you don't want to get up, you can put your hand on the person in front of you um, so that we can send them off in a good way. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the willingness of Karen and Brian and Gary to travel to South Carolina on the church's behalf. Um, we were grateful that they were willing to set aside a portion of their daily life to do the work of the church, and we're grateful for that. Lord, we also pray for traveling mercies for not just um, these three, but for everybody that is heading there, um, that they arrive safely, that they arrive joyously, ready to pray and do your work and do your will, Lord. Um, we ask, Lord, that as they enter into the business parts of this week, that they do so with open hearts, that they pray before they vote, that they listen with open ears, and that they're there to truly do the work of the church of your will, Lord. We also pray that as they enter into worship throughout the week, and we know they're going to worship, that they allow the Holy Spirit to enter into their hearts, into their minds, and that they are truly there with you, Lord, and that they're moved by all that you do within them. Um, and Lord, we pray all of this as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen amen thank you
quietly before the Lord. This is what we heard. Let these words speak to you. Look at the beauty. See the stillness. See the calm. There's no chaos here with me. I am your calm in the storm. I am your safe place. My arms are open to you. Walk in and just be. I speak healing. I speak love. I speak fullness. I speak life. I breathe life into dry bones. Rest in me. Do not be afraid. Seek me. Hear me. I am speaking. Faithfulness. Believe what I have said to you. I will show you the way. I will guide you. So stop, listen, hear my voice. I will give you everything that you need to do those things that I am calling you to do. Lift your eyes. Come to me. See what I am doing in the heavens. See what I am doing on the earth. See what I am doing in the hearts of my children. What do you see? Speak to me.